Can we all stand for scripture reading, please? I'm reading from Matthew 22, verse 37 and 38. <clears throat> Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the great commandment. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Is my mic working? Yes. yes. Okay. It's good to be back in Folsom. It's been a while since I've been here. And um, there's been a lot of things going on in the world, hasn't there? What do you think that's telling you? We're at the beginning? We're getting very close to the beginning of eternal life. That's what it is. Well, the message I have for you this morning um, is called Third Class Ticket. Um, how many of you actually have AFTV and you watched this week's Sabbath School lesson? Did any of you see that? No, not too many of you. Um, I had the privilege of teaching it, but that was like weeks ago that I taught it, so it was still not fresh in my mind. But it goes along with this lesson also, because what was this study about this morning? It was about a Jonah, but what was the actual title of the lesson? Avoiding what? Mission excuses? Ex avoiding excuses for mission. Did Jonah avoid that? I would say slightly. You know, when you look at that and you look at the whole scenario, Jonah was doing everything that he could to try and avoid everything. He did everything in his power. But that, what's that lesson that's taught to us? Sometimes we could try to avoid things too, but what happens? Better watch out for the big fish. Do you remember my testimony? That plane going into the water? That was my big fish. Now you have a choice at that point. Are you going to keep running? Or are you going to actually stop and really start listening? If you don't stop and start listening, there could be other fish that come along. And I don't know if you want that. So let's talk about third class ticket. Let's bow our heads, shall we, as we pray. Father in heaven, we come to you and we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath morning. I ask and pray that you would guide and direct this morning, that you would speak to every ear, and that you would convict our hearts, guide and direct my words. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, none of you are that old, but do you remember reading or watching about the stagecoach? Did you know there were three classes of tickets that you could buy for a stagecoach? Let's talk about the plane, for example. When you fly, you have different classes you can fly. You have the coach, which is where 80%, 90% of the people sit. Then the next bump up would be maybe a comfort level or something like that. What do you think is actually higher, business class or first class? No, actually business class is actually higher. I was just playing racquetball yesterday and I was talking with one of the guys that I play racquetball with, he's from Belize, and he has been a flight attendant, started off with Continental, and then he went to United Airlines. He's been with United for 37 years now, flying. He said his main route that he does, he just flies three times a month. And he basically does, I think, San Francisco to Singapore. Now that's a long flight. If you've done, I've done long flights before, some of them 19 hours, 18, 19 hours on a plane without touching the ground. That's a long time. I'll talk about a little later about what you can do to alleviate some of that time. But he says, I don't understand how people can pay ten to $12,000 for a flight to fly business first class. Can you imagine that? That's a lot of money. Now in the stagecoach, there were three classes you could buy a ticket for. There was a first class ticket. If you were fortunate enough and blessed enough to be able to afford a first class ticket, you buy a first class ticket and let's say the coach got stuck. 
Couldn't make it up the hill. Got stuck in the mud. The wheel fell off. Do you know what you do as a first class? You just stay right there. Because you paid for a first class ticket. But if you couldn't afford a first class ticket, and let's say you uh, could only scrounge enough for a second class ticket, well then, if the coach got stuck or couldn't make it up the hill, guess what you did? You got out. But you didn't have to do anything because you paid for second class. You just have to get out. But if you're like me and you couldn't afford first or second class and all you could afford was a third class ticket, well, Dan's been saying it the whole time. He kept saying, you go out, get out and you push. But yeah, third class, that's exactly what you do. If the coach got stuck in the mud, guess what? You take off your boots, get in the mud, and start pushing. If the wheel fell off, well, you may not be a mechanic, but figure it out. Get the wheel on, get the coach going again. You see, I bring that example to you because we have visitors today, and I, I don't want to point them out, but I will point them out because they're my lovely neighbors. Christy and Ed, will you raise your hands? Yeah. And they kept bugging me for the longest time. Let us know when you're preaching in the area because we want to come. So that's why they're here. Now, if you couldn't afford that third class ticket, then you know how you went? <laughs> that's pretty much it. You walk there, yeah. There's no way of mental telepathy getting yourself somewhere else. But see, if you paid for a first class ticket, Today in the church, our visitors, Christy and Ed are first class tickets, they don't have to do anything. They just sit here, they come. But then there are some of you who have been coming here for a long time. But you're not a member of the church, but you've been coming. You don't necessarily have to do anything during the fellowship lunch. You don't even have to bring anything. You're just, it's, we're just glad that you're here. But there are some of you who are third class ticket holders. That means you got to get out and do something. The coach gets stuck, get out and do something. There's time for an evangelistic series, guess what? Get out and do something. We're all first class people, but because we're members of the church, we're actually going third class in the fact that we've got to get out there and do something. In your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Many of you are familiar with this. You probably have it memorized. Matthew 28, looking at verse 19 and 20. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And what does he say to them? He says these words to them. Near the very end, Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Okay, there's two domains covered. Does Jesus first have the authority to do this? Yeah, why? He's the Son of God. Okay, so now he lists the territories. He lists heaven and earth. Are there any others? That's pretty much it. So he tells us now in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of some nations. Oh, that's a typo in my Bible. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Why, why those three? Because that's the Godhead. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not an essence of, it's not a separate thing. It is part of the Godhead itself. And it says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, let me ask you this question because this is a vital question. It says, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded to you. When are you really ready for baptism? When you kind of have it, a, a grasp of it? Or when you fully understand it? You see, this is where the, the fight comes in sometimes, where I've had fights with conference leaders about this, because they will say, oh, you know, you've got 28 fundamental beliefs. You only need to know just the 14 of them. And I'm thinking, did you date your wife just for a few dates and then that was good enough? Or did you really want to know the whole spectrum of what she's all about? Did you get it? 
you wonder ever, why, do we, why are we so concerned about just getting them underneath the water and baptizing them? Do you know why? You see, I spent many years in the business world. I was in sales and marketing. And I knew everything was based on the number. What are your year-end numbers? If your year-end numbers are low and everybody's high, guess what? You're a low producer. And what do they do with low producers? Bye-bye. Well, when Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, that's everything. This is the church. This is not a this is not a Fortune 500 company. We're not about numbers. We're about quantity. Yes? No. We're about quality. We're about making sure that people understand. Because this is the systemic problem in the church. We're so quick to make sure that we get the numbers, that we put people through baptism, and they don't really understand everything that they should understand. You know what happens then? All we're doing is baptizing another Laodicean in the church, another pew warmer. And this is not what Jesus has asked us to do. He says, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And he says, Lo, I'm with you Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. If you really believe that he's with you always, and if you really believe this is the Great Commission, then why aren't we busy? Why aren't we busy doing the work? I mean, everybody will, yeah, amen, amen, I believe this. But yet, we don't, we don't carry tracks with us. We're not ready to witness. We're not ready to pass out things. Ask yourself that question. You know, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual, page 55, did you know that deacons are supposed to actually be actively giving Bible studies? Did you know that? Many people don't realize that. But it says here that we are told that they were chosen. This is the deacons of the apostolic church. They were chosen and ordained to attend to the business of the church. But that's not just coming in, flicking on the lights, unlocking the doors, and turning on the air conditioning. It's not just that. They were engaged in the Lord's work. And notice what it says. Demanding qualifications, but slightly less exacting than those of an elder. Elders, should elders be giving Bible studies? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So deacons, slightly less. They have other things to do, but they should be qualified to actually teach and give Bible studies. You know, in this uh, book called Testimonies to Church, it says here, after a time, the zeal of the believers, their love for God and for one another began to wane. Coldness crept into the church. Do you know why the coldness came in? The coldness came in because they don't know what they believe. We've been baptizing frozen. <laughs> we are the frozen chosen. Does that make sense? And it says, differences sprang up. The eyes of many were turned from beholding Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. The masses that might have been convinced and converted by a faithful practice of the truth were left unworn. Then it was that the message was addressed to the Ephesian church by the true witness. And it says the following. Their lack of interest in the salvation of souls showed they had lost their first love. For none can love God with a whole heart, mind, and soul without loving those for whom Christ has died. Do you get it? Now, you've heard before that the right arm of our faith is what? The health message. We all know that. And what are we supposed to do with the health message? Live it and share it. But, you know, you can't share what you're not convicted of, number one. Number two, you can't share when this hand is wanting to do something and it's involved in the health message, but this hand, what's this hand supposed to do? This hand is supposed to be grabbing hold of God. Because without that connection to God, you're not going to have the ability to do this. You're not going to have the want to do this. Because then it's all about you. 
And it's not about you. It's about him. That's part of the problem that we have today is that we have put it all about us and we've forgotten it's all about Jesus. Now there was a story that was written in Gospel Workers and it says that there was a dream that Ellen White had. In this dream, she said that they, they were in this carriage or this big um, trailer that they were pulling by horses and they came into a city area and they dispersed and they were supposed to be looking for berries. But people immediately took off and they, they went instead of just looking for the berries right around the cart. She said that she went and she started looking at the berries and they, they were green ones, but then she said when you opened them up, you could see that there were really ripe ones inside, but you couldn't just grab them by the cluster. You had to pick them one by one. And she said they were beautiful wortle berries. The problem that we have is we're so busy looking on the outside that we're not really looking beyond that to be able to see what's ripe inside. Many people, she said, were off this way and they were running around and they were doing things and they were, their mind was so preoccupied on everything else when we really should be focused on this because this is what we're all about. Then we're told that little kids started running around and people started looking at the kids and they started getting distracted. Oh, look, look, there's something going on here. And pretty soon they forgot about what's supposed to be going on over here. Then she said, didn't you guys come out here to actually pick berries? Oh, they said, oh yeah, yeah, we came out here because you wanted to come out here. So we thought we would just come out and just accompany you. She said, if this is how you lay the work to be done, it's no wonder why our efforts are so futile. And what you're doing is actually going to be replicated by your children, because they're watching you. That's the problem that we have today, because we're not fully converted, we're not fully convinced of what it is that we should be doing, nor the message that we should have. But we're told in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached the whole world. And when that message is preached, then what happens? The end will come. Somebody said this morning in the class that our job is to just what? Plant seeds. Who said that this morning? That was you. Our job is to plant seeds. That's all we're supposed to do. Well, who does the growing? Who does the growing? The Lord does the growing. Do you know there's a reason why Johnny Appleseed was called Johnny Appleseed? Do you know why? He had seeds. He was passing out seeds. He was planting seeds. He was throwing seeds all over the place. Do you know if he didn't have seeds, do you know what his name would be? <laughs> Johnny. That's it. That would be just Johnny. What's so big about Johnny? Who cares? But Johnny Appleseed planted seeds. And you know, let's talk about the seed for a minute. Because some seeds, there's this one seed that is so amazing. It's not an apple seed. It's actually a bamboo seed. Now, you take this bamboo plant. It's a special Malaysian bamboo species. And you put it in the ground. Now, you know, typically you would look at that seed and you would water it, fertilize it, let the sun shine on it. And you would think, okay, in a few weeks, it'll pop up, right? Nothing. Nothing. After a year, nothing. What would you be thinking? It's like, it's dead. It's a, it's, a, it's a fake seed, whatever you want to call it. It's not doing anything, right? But you know what? There's a dormancy period with the Malaysian bamboo tree. The second year, guess what? Nothing. You're thinking, what? Nothing. Third year, nothing. Fourth year, nothing. Fifth year, something pops out. Now, 
doesn't seem like much, but do you know what? The Malaysian bamboo plant is in the Guinness Book of World Records, and it grows at a rate of 0 0.00001 mile an hour. And you're thinking, what? How slow is that? No, no, no. Let's put it in real perspective. How fast is 0 0.00001 mile per hour? That is this much in one day. This much in one day. 30 inches in one day. Now, back off. Because that's 90 feet a month. Did you do anything? No, you did nothing. You just planted the seed. You know, Andrew, one of the disciples, there's no book called Andrew, is there? Andrew didn't do a whole lot. There's no miracles that are performed. There's nothing really said about Andrew, but Andrew did one thing. He planted a seed in whose head? His brother, Simon Peter. Our job is to plant seeds. That's what we're all about. Let me tell you about James White. James White has the most astounding story. He was born in a little town called Portland, Maine. Everybody, anybody ever been to Maine? Beautiful area, lovely place. He was born August 14, 1821. He had older siblings, but one day when James was three years old, he had very high fever. He had convulsions. And this high fever and convulsions left him in a really terrible state. His eyes were crossed. His eyes were so crossed that he couldn't really see. And he went to school, he couldn't see the blackboard very well. Finally, the teacher came back and said, Mr. White, I'm sorry, but little James, he really can't see anything. It's really not worth him going to school at all. I think he should just stay home on the farm and help you. So that's what James did. He worked on the farm with his dad. When James turned 18 years old, he woke up one day and he says, you know, I, Mom, I'm, I'm seeing actually a little clearer today. A couple days later, later, all of a sudden, his eyesight was perfect. He could see. He was sitting down having a group chat with some of his friends, and they all started talking about their aspirations of what they wanted to do with their life. One said, hey, I want to marry the prettiest girl in the town, in the county. The other one says, I want to own the biggest farm in the county. And it came to James, James, what do you want to do? I want to go to school. And they all laughed, James, we know what happened to you. You couldn't see, you're too old for school. But I want to go to school so bad. James enrolled in elementary school at the age of 19. He walked five miles on Monday to school, stayed there, and on Friday he walked the five miles back. Do you know what? After 90 days, James received a certificate that he not only graduated, but he is certified to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. 90 days. I mean, you talk about determination. That's what James did. But then something happened to James. The Holy Spirit got to James, and James had this head, this thing in his head as he's teaching. The words kept insistently saying to him, tell your scholars, tell your students. And he couldn't break away from this thought. He's like, ah, stop. It's like a migraine. It wouldn't leave him alone. And finally he said, OK. I'll do it on a hill. He was overlooking, he was looking at the stars. He's trying to just focus on what was there. And this voice kept just pounding him, pounding him. And finally he says, OK, I'll do it. So he went to was all the students and he started telling them about the love of Jesus. Well, then he got calls to go and preach in a church. And after he started preaching in church, guess what happened to him? There was a small problem arose. 
You see, one time, there were 60 repentant sinners that stood up. And he's like, um, uh, praise the Lord, what do, I, what do I do? So he wrote his brother, who was a, a minister, and says, hey, can you come and help me? <laughs> do you know, by the time James was 22 years old, 1,000 people were converted and brought to the Lord because of his preaching. 1,000 people. Do you know what that says for us? <laughs> we are lazy. We're lazy. We're not, we don't have a passion to do that. We're so focused on doing other things. I mean, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if I go into your cars or dig into your purses right now, will I find tracks? Okay, some of you. Some of you. Take it easy, Leah. Some of you are excited for the gospel. But this is not for you guys. It's for the other ones that are like, well, I'm not sure. You know, I'm, I'm kind of scared. I'm introverted. You know, the Bible says, who gave man his mouth? Do you think God can do something? Look, look, if he can make a donkey talk, he can make you talk. Do you believe that? I didn't use the other word for the donkey, you know, but if he can make one of them talk, he can certainly give you the right words. But the problem is this. It could be that you are not praying and asking God to give you those words. Because if you're praying and asking God to do that, then guess what? He would do that. Something happened this week that I'm excited. I gotta tell you. I have somebody that I work with at, not work with, but she donates to the ministry at Amazing Facts. Her name is Shirley. She lives down in San Diego. Shirley is constantly passing out tracts. She's like, Pastor, can you send me some tracks, please? So I sent her some tracks. You know, we carry the tracks in their package in hundreds. So I sent her like 300 tracks. A few days later, she would call and says, Pastor, I need more tracks. Okay, I'll send you more tracks, Shirley. Then a couple weeks later, she would call. I would up it, like, you know, I would send her 800 tracks. A couple weeks later, she would call. Pastor, <laughs> I need more tracks. Okay. So I'd send her more tracks. So I thought, okay, I'm going to send her now 3,000 tracks. That'll keep her quiet for a while. <laughs> Are you kidding? Three weeks. Pastor, I need more tracks. Shirley, what are you doing with these tracks? She's like, I'm going out every morning. R really? She says, yes, Pastor. I go out at 4.30 every morning. And I pass, I take 300 tracks with me, and I pass them out. I put them on the cars, and I pass them out of people out there. I do that every morning. She says, I do seven, over 17,000 steps in the morning. Wow. This week, she called me, and she said, Pastor, I went to this parking lot, and the security guard said, that it was okay for me to do that. And so I started passing out the tracks, putting them on the cars. The next thing I know, there were two policemen there. And they said, what are you doing? I need your ID. Give me your driver's license. They were just really nasty. And she was quite shaken up. She's like, what, what am I supposed to tell them? I said, well, what did you do? She says, well, I told them I don't have any ID. She says, but now I do. I take my purse with me everywhere I go now, and I'll, I'll produce it to them. I found out that one of the residents didn't like it, and they called the police. She said, what should I do? Should I go back there again? I said, no, Shirley, don't go back there. Go somewhere else. I said, you know, this happened to Jesus, too, where he tried to share, and they didn't want to listen. And he said, well, he shook the dust off his sandals and go to the next one. What I didn't tell you is, Shirley is 88 years old. 88 years old. She called me yesterday morning. I didn't answer because I was playing racquetball. And she called me and she said on the voicemail, Pastor, 
I went to tr pass out tracks. I talked to my son, who's a doctor. He said the same thing you did. Shake the dust off your sandals, go somewhere else. Don't go back there. She said, but I always go to that parking lot because it's a big parking lot. And, and as I went by there this time, I passed the parking lot and there was a young man that showed up. And the young man said, what are you doing? And she says, well, I'm passing out these tracks. And the young man says, I'll help you. Amen. And a, she gave him 100 tracks. He says, I'll go to another area to pass them out for you. And she was so excited telling me this, I called her yesterday evening on the way to the meetings at uh, Granite Bay, and I said, surely that was not just a young man. That was an angel that was sent to help you. Do you know that? And she's like, oh, I never thought of that. Wow, yes, that was an angel. Because he took them and he went out and distributed. See, in our earnestness, when we go out, the Lord will give us the accompaniment that we need. He will give us the encouragement. When we don't know what to do, He'll direct us. He will direct us if we ask for help. But you know what? You don't ask, you don't get. Isn't that what Matthew 7, 7 says? Ask, seek, knock, and it will be open for you. But if you don't ask, you don't get. I want to tell you a testimony here that came from Penn Juliet. Do you know that name? You don't know Penn Juliet, but you know the name Penn and Teller. Penn and Teller is the famous Las Vegas magic show. Teller doesn't say anything. He's the short little guy. Penn is the big guy, he's the loud, obnoxious guy. Teller doesn't do anything. He speaks, but in the act he doesn't do anything. He's just a mute. But Penn is actually a professed atheist, a very staunch atheist. But this is what somebody had said something to him and his response was this. I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there is a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell and not having eternal life and you think that it's not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward and atheists would think people shouldn't proselytize and who say, just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself. He says, how much do you have to hate people to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe that everlasting life is possible and to not tell them? And then he says, I mean, if I believe without a shadow of a doubt that there was a truck coming and it was going to hit you and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there comes a certain point where I'm going to tackle you. And this is more important than that. Do you have a passion for people who don't know Jesus? If you don't, you got a problem. Because something's missing in your life. And something missing is this connection. You see, we find that we're told that a man is no sooner converted than in his heart is born a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving, sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in the heart. The spirit of Christ illuminating the soul is represented by light and it dispels all darkness. It's compared to salt because of its preserving qualities. Now, what do you think? Should you say something? Pastor Rod, I'm going to pick on you because I know you'd be a good candidate for this. Could you stand up for a minute for me? How long have you been married to Sabrina? 30 years. 30 years. Do you love her? Yes. That was pretty quick, wasn't it? Could, could you come up here? I'm going to actually come down to meet you here. Don't fire me on Monday. 
Okay, I, looking at Sabrina, are you red? Did he just go red? <laughs> could, you, could you tell everybody here how much you love her? I love her enough to be a, a good witness to her. Anything else you want to say? Uh, I'll let her speak to the rest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I was in Bogenhofen in Austria, and I, I asked a man who was sitting right here in the front row with his wife, and I said, um, how long have you been married? And he told me like 47 years, and I said, could you stand up and tell everybody how much you love your wife? You know what he said to me? Do I have to? <laughs> and I thought, whoa, you're in big trouble, man. <laughs> big trouble. He finally got up enough nerve. I, don't, I, I was trying to see if there was an elbow that was going into his rib, but there was no elbow. But he finally got up there and he finally said something. But I'm sure he probably didn't have very many home-cooked meals after that. <laughs> you know, the, the situation for us here is, listen to this. We're told here in a magazine article that was written in Australia, it says, if the people of the world do not see that you are different from those who are around them, they will not be influenced by your profession or religion. And you will not be a saver of Christ, and you will win no soul to the service of God. But there will be no one in heaven with a starless crown. If you are saved, there will be some soul in the courts of heaven that has found an entrance there through your instrumentality. You may not have to say anything. All you may have to do is just plant the seed. Now, I, I forgot to bring a track with me. See, I, I was looking right at Leah because I figured, okay, you have one right on you? Okay, this is a test to see who's actually got some tracks. There we go. Oh, it's in Spanish. Okay, see these little tracks? They do a lot of damage. All you have to do is leave them. You don't even have to say anything. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. You leave them on the gas pumps. Some of you mail them with your bills and stuff like that. You know what I do with these? I sneak into, no, I don't sneak in. I walk into Walmart. And then I'll take a stack of them and I'll go through the clothing section and I'll look at the men's jeans and I'll just slide one in the back pocket. <laughs> Christy, don't report me, okay? <laughs> and I'll go into jackets, you know, slide one in the jackets. I'm careful to slide them because I know that they're watching. <laughs> then I'll go into the grocery section and the beer, a case of beer, the ones that are about alcoholism, I'll have those ones, and I'll, I'll punch the handles, and I'll just, as I punch the handles, I'll slide one in. And I'll go to the, the baby section, and I'll have ones on like families, and I'll take a case of diapers and just punch the handles and drop one in there. I'll do things in different, Christy, don't tell everybody on the, the neighborhood, okay? But this is what I'll do, you pass them out. Can you get in trouble? Yeah, what are they going to say? Don't do that. Okay, I won't do that. I'll tell you what happened. I was at Andrews at a grocery store. They're a big grocery chain called Myers. It's kind of like a Walmart. And I'm pushing my cart along, and I always have them kind of with my cart. And I saw some lady go by, and she had her cart there, and she had her purse. Women always like to carry their purse, you know, with, with the hammers and saws and whatever they have in there. And it was a big mouth one. And I thought... Okay. I grew up playing hockey, and we had hockey cards, so you always... I got really good at throwing these, so I thought, okay, there she goes. She turned around to go to the fruit section to pick something up, and I thought, I threw it, and this thing just went through the air, and it was perfect right into the bag. But there was a problem. As it went flying through the air, there was this huge black guy that was walking by, and it went right across his face. He looked at, and I thought, oh boy, I'm in big trouble now. He looked at the bag, he looked at the, because it landed face up, he looked at that, 
And then he looked at me, and he's like, yeah, I'm an Adventist too. And I thought, how awesome is that? That's great. When I fly in a plane, I take the tracks with me. When you got 18 hours in the plane and there's nothing to do and you have just one magazine in the front, what are you going to do? I don't really pass it. I don't go down the aisle here. Pretzels, would you like one? I don't do that. What I'll do is I'll go into the bathroom. I'll put him in the bathroom and set him right next to the toilet. Because, you know, some people need reading material, right? So I'll put him right there. And then I walked in one time, and I had seen, because I was sitting near the toilet, and I could see the stewardess went in there, and I'm watching to see who's coming out, right, to case them and see, are they taking one or not? But then after the stewardess went there, I thought, I got this bad feeling. So I looked around, I went back in there, and she had thrown it in the garbage. Okay, this is war, lady. I pulled out the paper towel rack and I started stuffing them in the paper towels. So when they pull them out, they get a track. Isn't that, you can do that? And you know those free magazines? The free magazines that you get? I didn't have tracks one day. And I thought, man, what am I gonna do? I pulled out the magazine, I started leafing through the pages. And then I grabbed in my camera bag my big Sharpie marker, and I thought, okay, I found this beautiful page. It was a, I think it was a page for American Express. It was a beautiful white stand beach with this beautiful long coconut tree, palm tree hanging out, and it had big, wide open blue sky. And I thought, okay. I took out my marker and I wrote John 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not. He said, if you think this is beautiful, you should see what your heavenly father has in mind for you. That takes a little bit more time. But it's a free magazine. So start doing that. You can do it very simply. And it doesn't take very much at all. But this is what we're supposed to be doing. Now, Christy, I'm going to snitch on you for a bit here. I go in and, and I check on them every once in a while after work or Sundays or Friday. One day I walked in there and I was sitting down talking to Ed. Christy looked at me and she says, you know, the thing I like about you, Alden, is you don't push your religion on people. And I didn't. And she came. Did I push it on you? No. But she sent a message to everybody in the street on our court, but they didn't want to come because they thought I was going to convert them all to Adventism. <laughs> That's not my job, is it? No. no, not my job at all. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But we have a job to do. All you third class citizens, you got a job to do. Get out there and pass these. I got to tell you another story. I was flying from Cape Town to Johannesburg, and it was one of those unearthly early morning flights at 6 o'clock. I had ordered a vegetarian meal. And I, I had one great controversy with me, and I thought, okay, who am I going to give this to? Who, who should I give this book to? And I'm sitting in the exit row, and I look to my left, and there are two young ladies there, and I thought, okay, let me, let me talk to them. So I talked to them, but they didn't speak a stitch of English. I didn't know what language they spoke. And I thought, okay, this is in English. It's not going to do any good there. So I look over on this side. <laughs> There's some big dude sitting over here. His sleeves are rolled up. He's got his arms crossed. He's got his sunglasses on his head. He's got a gold chain around it. He's got a pack of cigarettes in his pocket. And I'm thinking, no. No, I, I judged him right there. So then the food came. And normally I like salads, but not at 6 o'clock in the morning. So they had yogurt there too, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to eat. I'll wait till I arrive. And I watched the, the big dude over here. He didn't get the same meal I got. He got scrambled eggs, sausage, 
bacon. I mean, he, he ripped open that salt pack. And you know these people that salt things before they taste anything? He was doing that, and I saw him, and it wasn't even like chewing. It was just like three, four, chew, down the hatch. And I thought, oh, man, he's really enjoying his food. So I picked up my yogurt, and I said, hey, would you like to have my yogurt too? He's like, you're not eating it? I said, no. He's like, why? Because uh, I, I don't eat yogurt. And then he looks at me, and he grills me. His eyes get squinty, and he says, is it because of health reasons or religious reasons? And I swallowed hard, and I'm thinking, oh. I said, both? And he says, what religion are you? And I said, I'm Jehovah. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said to him, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And he says, me too! And I, t I, I kid you, I looked at this guy and I just went off on him. And I said, look, you got tattoos, you got smoke, you just ate half a pig. <laughs> and then he says, okay, I'm a backslidden Adventist. And I thought, oh man, I feel so bad now. But then I thought, my book. I said, hey, remember growing up? Did you ever read this? He's like, oh, yeah, that's been years ago. I said, dude, if there's ever a time in this world history you got to get serious, it's now. you got to read this. And he just lit up. Really? I said, look, you know all this stuff. You've heard it many years ago. This is the time you get serious. Well, guess what? His brother happened to be a friend of mine on Facebook. I didn't know that. His brother sends me a message after we arrived in Johannesburg, and he says, what? Pastor, did you say to my brother? Because he's on fire right now. We don't have to do anything except plant the seed. You with me? That's all you have to do, plant the seed. It may take lots of seed. It may take a lot of stuff that's worn out. But you know what? We just have to plant the seed. We, got, we get incredible stories that come through. If you ever want something to do, if you're retired and you've got nothing to do, Bible School at Amazing Facts could use your help. And we've got three people that work really hard on Mondays, and they gather all the mail, and sometimes they'll share with me the stuff that comes through in their letters. And some of these letters are so incredible that you just can't believe what you're reading because is this really possible? Let me read to you a letter that came through. Thank you, Amazing Facts. I love your ministry. When I was young, a young girl, I remember asking God, where is your real church? The one who teaches like in Jesus' day. 30 years later, my friend found Jesus in prison and went on to become a Seventh-day Adventist minister. Before he left for his ministry, he invited me to his church, but I refused. I thought they were a cult. 30 years after that, I moved to Washington to help my daughter. While, while there, I prayed for God to lead me to a church he wanted me in. I found this book called The National Sunday Law Pamphlet on a computer, on, sorry, on a counter at Costco. <laughs> let, let me say that to you again. While at Costco, I found the book on the counter. It was the National Sunday Law. I started to read it. After I finished the pamphlet, I decided to search out for the closest Adventist church to go. I've been going over since I w I've been going there ever since I've been baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have not looked back since. Thank you, Amazing Facts. I've learned more since I've been studying from you than ever before. I love you all, and I love the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. You don't have to do much. You don't have to say much. But all you have to do is pray every day that the Lord would lead you to somebody who is hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And if you pray that, I'll tell you, reach across, grab that seatbelt, click it in, pull tight. 
because you're going to go for a ride today. And at the end of the day, you're going to say, wow, wow, what an amazing trip. There's been, I, I can't tell you all the different stories. There's just so many of them, but it happens all the time. Your experience can be exactly the same if you also will surrender your life and give the Lord the opportunity to use you to tell that there is something better. Do you love to tell the story? Let's sing 457, shall we, as we close. 457, I love to tell the story.